Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 94. I'll keep this introduction brief, as both these gentlemen have been guests on my show before. I will be hosting a dialogue here between Dr. Michael Levin and Dr. Bernardo Castro. Those of you who are subscribed to my channel, I suspect you will enjoy this conversation as I did. And if you are not familiar with the work of either of these gentlemen, I'll have plenty of information in the description field if you want to do a, a quick check into who they are. But most of you who are subscribed will know these gentlemen. So enjoy. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Levin and Dr. Bernardo Castrup to the IdeaCast interview series. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, not do a formal introduction of these two gentlemen. If you're not familiar with their names or faces, I have plenty of information down in the description field. Uh, you're welcome to go uh, do a cursory overview and then come back and engage with this conversation. But nonetheless, welcome YouTube audience. Uh, if any of you are like me, this is a wonderful occasion here, a really great opportunity to have two great minds discussing uh, some what I consider to be very important matters or non-matters uh, in, in human experience and our history. So welcome to both of you, Michael and Bernardo. So glad to have you on the show. Thanks so Thank much for having us. Yeah. One of one of my intuitions in asking you all to get together for a conversation is, A, I've spent a lot of hours uh, watching both of your work, reading uh, books and reading things that are in the literature. And I just felt there was this uh, sort of um, ground floor or this platform um, that you all can occupy that is that is sort of a tapestry of, of similar ideas and thoughts. And um, so we'll start with that. We'll start with where you all are in, uh, I don't know if, it, if in Europe they say, but we're, you know, same church, different pews kind of uh, metaphor. But yeah, let's start with that and uh, explore some ideas and thoughts. And then for the audience later on, we'd like, to, I'd like to bring this conversation into uh, what the buzz is all about these days, which is machine learning, uh, intelligence that's n what we would call non-normal and diverse. And so, and this is a lot of what Michael's work addresses. And so I'd like to open that up and explore some ideas that um, speak to intelligence. It's otherwise obfuscated from us uh, in our, in our uh, sort of consciousness as a society. So uh, gentlemen, uh, let's see, Michael, with you, I, I mentioned before we hit record, I love the idea of uh, technical approach to mind everywhere. And maybe that could be a casual frame for, for this conversation. Um, so I'll start with you, and um, if you had a question for Bernardo about his work and, and maybe to understand um, the, the, the commonality of the work or, or where you all might be aligned, um, we could start with that and then, and then and see where that flows. Sure. Um, well, I guess, first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank you for uh, setting this up, and uh, this was a great um, uh, kind of uh, excuse for me to uh, really dive into things. I mean, I've had uh, Bernardo stuff sitting here on my desk for quite some time and wanting to kind of dig in, and this was this was great. So I've been going through the, I haven't finished, but I've been going through the idea of the world. Um, I like it a lot. I think this it's a super, super interesting book. And um, uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, so 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 this is great. Um, I guess I guess to start with, I think what what I would love is uh, for, for just to, for Bernardo to speak to. Um, I have some more specific specific questions, but I think it would be nice to just get a more uh, general um, kind of overview of what he thinks is uh, the most uh, important um, central uh, kind of uh, piece of what he's trying to transmit, and then we'll we'll go from there. Should I should I jump in? Yeah, if you want to give a, a thesis statement, yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, let me first say, Michael just made my day. I mean, I already knew I was interested in his work, but I did not expect at all that he would be interested in mine, let alone have something of me lying on, on his desk. Oh, yeah. So uh, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Um, so very briefly, um, the idea behind objective idealisms, uh, of which um, I, I'm a proponent, I'm, I have one particular version of objective idealism called analytic idealism. The idea is that um, nature out there is mental. It's not made of our mental states, my mental states, your mental states. It's made of mental states at large, so to say. Um, there is a real objective world out there that does not depend on our wishes, does not change merely because we observe it and would still be around even if we all disappeared. But that world, too, is made of mental states. 
one way to to visualize this is to think of my own thoughts my thoughts from your perspective are objective and external my thoughts would still be here even if you were not and my thoughts would not change merely because of an act of your volition um, in the, exactly the same way just as my thoughts think of nature at large as made also of mental states that are subjective from their own perspective but objective from yours and do not depend on your own private uh, mm -hmm. mentation and the next key point is okay how does this boundary emerge between my mental state and the mental states of nature at large and the idea there is to leverage an empirical phenomenon that we know exists and have understood much better over the last 20 years since the advent of neuroimaging which is psychiatric dissociation uh, it used to be called multiple personality disorder now it's called dissociative identity disorder we know that a did looks like something when you put patients under a brain scanner in other words there is an image um, dissociative processes look like something they have an appearance an extrinsic appearance and uh, my postulate would be that life biology metabolism is the appearance of uh, dissociative processes in this transpersonal field of subjectivity that nature is uh, it, dissociation in that field looks like metabolism biology uh, life and that's the the point where um, I you know my work flows into Michael's work or the other way around mm -hmm. the biology part yeah wow um yeah that's that's very beautiful and uh, i i love that uh, i love that uh, you started right with with that uh, the kind of this this dissociation thing because that's that's very central to my work as well and i often think about these questions of uh basically what's fundamental to all the stuff we do is this uh, trying to understand the scaling of minds and uh, how uh, how that border between between a given uh, a given self and the outside world or other minds is formed, and we can start thinking about it in the kind of the the conventional um, the traditional thing that happens is during embryogenesis we all start out life as one blastoderm, which is basically this like flat disc that's uh, I don't know at that some point you know ten thousand cells fifty thousand cells, and we look at that thing and we say oh there's one embryo. And eventually it will be one human, let's say in the case of humans, and it will be a, a mind and people tend to think of themselves as some sort of integrated self. But one cool thing that you can do is uh, if you, you and I, I used to as a, as a grad student, I did this with duck, uh, duck embryos, um, you can take a little needle and you can scratch, uh, you can put some scratches into that blastoderm and uh, what will happen is the islands that you make that are not connected to each other just, just for a few hours, eventually they heal back up, but just for a few hours. Each one of those will self-organize into its own embryo because each each of those right so 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 normally there's a process whereby you get one uh, organizing uh, a center and then the and then every it, it sort of every everything else you know uh, cooperates and becomes one embryo but but you get multiples and then they and then they heal up and you get multiple conjoined twins or triplets or or, or whatnot and so so from the very beginning we have this idea that we start off with this kind of. Uh, pool of potentiality where you don't know how many individuals are there. It could be zero, one, two, probably up to half a dozen. And then, you know, so it's not genetically determined, it's physiologically determined, and then they self-organize and you have multiple individuals. So, so I, I, we are really interested in this notion of like setting the borders, you know, and every cell is some other cells neighbor. And so at the beginning of development and evolution, you, you have to be able to scale up and you have to say, I, this is the stuff that's part of one uh, self. And then this is the stuff that's the outside world. And then, and then of course we study the, um, the failures of that process. And which is, as, as you just pointed out, there's a kind of somatic dissociative disorder, which we see as cancer, that li literally the, the border between self and world, you know, these cells, their, their cognitive light cones shrink and, and they treat the rest of the body as just uh, external environment. So anyway, so, so that was great. I, th I think that's, that's like a very central thing for science and philosophy both. So would you would you regard? I mean, you said you know, when you, you can put scratches and create artificial boundaries. Do you think dissociation is is a good metaphor for what happens? Then you create sort of isolated cognitive environments. I I really do because what what will happen is if you leave it that way, what will happen is you will literally get multiple human individuals, and so th these exist, right? So so we can have of course animals models like this, but also there are human models where um, you will have in the same body you will literally have 
uh, two, I, I don't know of cases of more than two that have survived, but 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 two that have absolutely distinct uh, personalities, you know, it, that they will report different inner perspectives, although in some cases they can kind of um, uh, uh, communicate also with each other, you know, non-verbally, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's a very um, drastic uh, version, the kind of a uh, shorter version or, or kind of a smaller version is, uh, is, is these, these uh, defections that we see in cancer where, and we can, and we can actually, we have techniques now to try to reinflate it. So we have tools now that we've understood a little bit about the kind of, I call this a cognitive glue. It's this, the mechanism that binds subunits together into a, co into a coherent whole. So we have a little bit of control over that now. And so we can play with those boundaries, you know, bigger and smaller uh, during uh, in animal models, of course, uh, but we can, we can play with that. And I have specifically referred to cancer as a dissociative identity disorder of the collective intelligence of the body. I mean, I think it's like, that's, that really is what it is. Just in, you stop me. I, I'm, I'm I'm fascinated by this. So you, you stop me if you want to move on to another topic. No, uh, I'm I'm interested in this going back and forth. And and I later on I might I might add something in. But yes, please go ahead. Keep asking questions. <laughs> Michael, you did a lot of work on morphogenesis. How, how does the structure uh, of the body emerges? Um, because DNA in and of itself, it's a protein factory. It makes the bricks, exactly. but how, exactly. what knows how to put the bricks together to create Cologne exactly. Cathedral, right? Exactly. The cathedral is more than just the brick factory. Yeah. Um, do you think that when you created this sort of cognitive island, can, it, can we model the way in which it maintains its integrity and its unity? Do you think it's possible to model it entirely through local interactions, even if they are electromagnetic fields, local interactions without a sort of an, an overall global template um no uh the short well the short so so the short the short answer is no i don't think so i mean one of the one of the key things about this whole embryonic thing which i think is quite instructive for and i'm not a philosopher but but it's, i think it is instructive for issues in philosophy is that when we look at that blastoderm and we say oh look there's an embryo what are we really counting when we say there's one embryo? Because, because there are many cells, right? There isn't one of anything obvious in any obvious way. So what we're really counting is alignment. We're counting um, the fact that not only are all of those cells working together to take one specific journey in this anatomical morphous space from like the shape of us, you know, an early blastoderm to the shape of a, whatever the final target morphology is going to be. Not only are they all committed to, to that journey together, they will actively uh, correct if you try to deviate them. So there are, so so you know, in some of my our, our papers, we I go through all these different amazing examples of uh, perturbations and and different things you can do. They they are all committed to that one particular journey, and what that entails is a. Um, an emergent individual that has a goal. It has a goal of specifically of reaching that, that journey and all of the pieces, basically all of the individual cells and the molecular networks below them, their action space and their landscape is being deformed by this. I mean, it's a kind of top-down, I know that's very controversial, but I, I, I think there's a kind of top-down causation here where, where this higher level actually deforms the, the energy landscape for the, for the lower levels. And they all kind of take this journey together. And in order to do that, you can zoom in and you can make models of local interactions, but you'll be missing the boat if uh, you're not taking into account the idea that what's really uh, driving all of this is a very large scale vision that no individual cell has. So for example, like when, you know, salamanders regenerate their limbs and, you know, so you can amputate the limb and then, and then they regrow. No individual cell knows what a finger is or how many fingers you're supposed to have. And you can model low level interactions exactly how, you know, you can model, um, you can zoom in to a to a to a computer and you can look oh look there's the electrons you know going here and there but you're going to miss the whole point if you don't realize that actually there's a goal seeking cybernetic system that's very large scale and that cannot be captured by any local interactions that's the, the, it's it's the goal of the entire system it's not the goal of any other parts how how would you you account for this global template that has top down causation we, uh, to to say account, you mean where does it come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in yeah, your that's... mind, I'm, I'm I'm inviting you to speculate. Yeah, yeah. That's that's re that's really a, a very deep question, of course. Um, so in in the short term, 
we can see where it comes from and that we've developed techniques to actually visualize it. So one of the things that we've done is stolen many ideas from, from neuroscience and exported them to uh, outside. So I, I don't believe that neuroscience is about neurons at all. I think it's about much deeper principles of cognitive scaling. And what we can use is, is, is some of those same approaches. And, and, you know, there's this, um, task of uh, neural decoding, right? So people that what they want to scan the brain and they want to decode the information and extract the cognitive content, your memories, your goals, and so on. So it turns out we can, we can do that with other tissues. Uh, and we've developed techniques where you can literally see. So, so we have a number of examples where if you read the large scale, and it's not local, if you read the large scale bioelectric pattern uh, of, of, a, of a piece of tissue, you can tell what the goals of that tissue are. You can literally see what the future is going to be. This is what it's trying to work on. So for example, in pieces of flatworms, I, we, we, can, we can see that, okay, they know they need one head and I can actually rewrite that now. And I say, no, actually you need two heads. And that's in the future, not now, but in the future, that is what you will build because that's now your, your future representation of what a correct worm looks like. So in the short term, if we're doing well, we can see it, but there's a much deeper problem, which I think is what, what you're referring to, which is where do these things come from in the first place, right? Which I, which I think is really, really profound. And Typically, the way, as you know, the way people answer that question is they lean on evolution and they say that, well, it's, uh, you know, uh, everything that uh, that didn't uh, have that encoded pattern died out. And uh, now this is what you have is what you have. And I, I, I think that's not remotely the full story, because what what we and others have been doing is creating novel uh, creatures that have never existed before. So now with, with, with bioengineering and synthetic morphology, you can take advantage of this plasticity of life and you can make new things that have never been selected for specific new patterns. And yet very quickly, in fact, even in standard, like we can make a tadpole and we can, um, instead of the eyes in the head, we can put an eye, eye on his tail and you don't need generations of evolutionary adaptation. They can see immediately, right? We can test them on visual cues. They see right away. And, and that eye doesn't connect to the brain and connects to the spinal cord or sometimes to nothing. And those animals, we can see quite, quite well. And this, this plasticity is incredible. And we have many more examples of it. So, so it's a good question. Where does it come from? In the end, I think uh, the, the answer is going to be something like wherever the truths of mathematics live, right? In other words, I, 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 I think that... You know, with the same, you could, people have been asking the same question, where does the distribution of crimes come from? Where does, you know, these things that are not relying on physical facts of the universe. I suspect it's that. I suspect, I mean, I completely agree with you. I was, I was reading this, uh, I was reading your book and, um, you know, this idea that, that uh, we're really, uh, and, and you can, you can say more about that if you would, uh, that, that it really is mental and there's an objective mental reality out there. I, 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 th I think in the end, that is what we're exploring. I see all of these synthetic beings and everything that we're making. I see them as a kind of um, periscope that you can stick up into the space a little bit and look around and maybe a vehicle that you can navigate a little bit. And uh, yeah, you can explore this, this amazing latent space that we normally don't get to see. Just, I promise this is the last one, just No, 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 not at all. Go, keep going. <laughs> By all means, um, you, you you show in your work, Michael, and you alluded to this that um, on the short term you can't go and interfere with that template. Doesn't it suggest that uh, you then know where it's coming from, we, or is it purely empirical? No, we we know where it comes from. In fact, in fact, in the, I, I suppose there's two senses of the word. Where does it come from? In the in the in the short term we can see from the one cell, especially in the frog where you can see everything, uh, it, from the one cell stage, we can see this pattern developing and, and you can manipulate it. We know the mechanisms, we model it. So, so we have um, you know, quantitative simulations of all this stuff. So in the short term, we see all that. In the, but, but I think there, the, but, but there is a deeper question here, which is sort of like, um, it's, so I use with my students, I, I use this, this very kind of simplistic example. You know the Galton board? Right, the thing with the with the nails, and you 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 dump a bunch of marbles on it, and the marbles you know sort of fall, and they always make this like binomial distribution. So this is so you ask, well, where it's a beautiful shape. Where does it come from, and where is it encoded? And people ask me all the time, so where's the pattern encoded, right? And like encoded is a funny thing because you can look at the nails, and you can look at the wood, and you can look at the marbles. You're not going to find the encoding of this of this you know of this nice nice shape, right? And so so there is still even though we have the mechanism and we can rewrite it at least in a few cases you know quite well, uh, 
there's something beyond being able to, uh, to to sort of see it and manipulate it, which is sort of like the essence of it. It's I don't think we have the vocabulary, at least I don't have the vocabulary for it. Um, there's there's something there's something else there, which I think you know, as my my reading of, of 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 you know Pythagoras and Plato, I think that's exactly what they were going for, right? I don't know if you agree. I, I'd love to hear what what you yeah, have to say. I, I agree. I agree. I I, I I think there is more to to the whole issue of life than uh, than than we suspect. Mm. But I, I find it fascinating that um, even though you can see the sort of local expression or footprint of the pattern you 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 remain rigorous and honest um to realize that uh, you're not seeing where it's actually coming from um and you, you you don't succumb to the temptation to say well there's more to understand but i understand enough to know that i can extrapolate this to local electromagnetic field interactions or yeah. chemical environments so, but, yeah, yeah. I, no, I find this topic fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I think it's much, it's much deeper. And I mean, I love, you know, so, so, so in my group, we do a lot of, um, at least I hope to uh, move a lot of this stuff to, to medicine, right, to very practical applications. So we have applications in birth defects and cancer and all that. But, and that's, and that's great. And we definitely want uh, that kind of like uh, a tight empirical um, uh, connection. But, but there is, but there is something, something deeper here. And, and you really start to see it when, uh, when you look at uh, the kinds of um, novel constructions that you've never, you know, that that have never been uh, specifically selected for, and we see this all the time. We see it in we see it in problem solving. So, so some of the experiments we do, we confront uh, various uh, living tissues in different spaces. So, physiological state space, anatomical space, and so on. Uh, and by the way, I, so so I, I think those spaces are are as 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 real as this like three dimensional space that that we see we see now. I think all of these are, are are critical, and we see them solving novel problems they've never seen before. And so what I see is two things: I see evolution making problem solving agents as opposed to specific solutions to specific problems. I, I see this amazing um, plasticity, and I see their ability to navigate this uh, latent space of possibilities, which we normally only see very narrowly. We normally only see, you know, one kind of outcome and maybe people study developmental plasticity and they see a few things, but, but overall there's, I, I really, I really think there's a lot more to it than, than, than what we're able to see. And this, and this question of what else is out there, I think it's a very practical question because when you see a certain embryo, you say, ah, that's what the, here's, here's an, an example that I kind of love. I mean, have you ever seen um, those plant galls the, very, the, the different structures that exist on leaves. You ever see? You ever see those? So, so the amazing thing is that we look at uh, the the acorn and we look at the the oak genome and we say, okay, we know what this thing can make. It makes flat green leaves. That's what it makes. That that's it done. But then along comes this amazing bioengineer, this this wasp, and it prompts literally. It doesn't micromanage any more than we do in our lab. It it prompts the leaf with some signals. And they make this crazy red spiky thing that's round. And I'm like, what? And, and we would have never known that that's even possible if, if we didn't see that. So, so exploring this space and this question of like, what else is out there? Uh, I think, I think it's really, is really critical. And it, this shows that there is more to DNA than just a protein factory, right? Because even though a protein factory only makes the bricks, not Cologne's cathedral, if you we mess up with DNA, morphogenesis changes. The 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 form that emerges changes. Do you have thoughts about this? About DNA being more than just a brick factory, yeah. and and how does it play a role in morphogenesis? Yeah, yeah. So 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 here's here's an interesting thing. Um, I, I I and and I, you know uh, I don't want to downplay the role of the hardware because because good hardware is as we we all know is is crucial. But and, and and of course, uh, developmental. So so um, when I talk to my students, I, I say, look, here's your developmental biology textbook. And what the developmental biology textbook has are some of the really nice examples where messing around with the hardware gives specific predictable outcomes as to what's going to happen, telling you that this hardware is really important. And that's great. That's that's what's in here is a self is a very selected set of examples. Now there's this whole other set of stuff that you really isn't in here and that nobody ever talks about, which is at least to, for, to me just just as important. And I'll give you a, 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 one of my um, favorite examples. Um, and and, and the, the punchline to the story is going to be that uh, I think that uh, 
really the hardware software analogy is helpful to us here because because it, it's important when nobody's downplaying the role of DNA, but it, it doesn't tell the, the whole story. And so uh, there, there's these newts and um, in the newt, uh, what you can do in the, in, the early, uh, in the early egg, once they're fertilized, is you can prevent the cell from dividing for a little bit. Um, and what happens if you do that is the DNA continues to divide, but the cell doesn't divide. And so you get, you get a, uh, uh, an embryo where each cell has too many chromosomes. So instead of 2N, you might have 4N, 6N, 5N, 8N, and so on, right? So the first, the first amazing thing you get from that is that you still get perfectly normal newts. So that's interesting. The actual amount of genetic material isn't a problem. Interesting. Second thing that happens is the cells will adjust to the amount of DNA and the cells get bigger, but the newt is exactly the same size. So what you have is fewer cells that match. So second interesting thing, huh? The cells match their number to their new size, right? And that didn't happen through long periods of evolution. Like you just did it and there it is, it, it works. Okay. The third amazing thing is that if you look at, there's a, there's, a, there's a tube, a little tubule that goes to the kidneys. If you take a cross section through this tubule, you see it around a circle in a normal newt, meh, eight to 10 cells, and they sort of work together and they make this like, and then, and then it goes like that. Well, when these cells get bigger and bigger, eight to 10 don't fit anymore. So, if, so there's a fewer of them, right? So that's kind of cool. But, but the real cool thing happens is when you, uh, when you make the cell so big that only one cell can fit. What happens? The cell bends itself around an empty spot in the middle, and you still get exactly the same tubule, right? So now here's why, why this is neat, is because that's a completely different molecular mechanism. So here you had cell-to-cell -cell communication. Here you have cytoskeletal bending. You have one cell bending itself. So, so talk about top-down causation. In the service of a high-level anatomical goal, you can call up different molecular mechanisms the stuff that had to be provided by DNA. If the DNA didn't give you cytoskeletal proteins and you know all these other things, yeah, you wouldn't have anything true enough. But 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 looking at the DNA uh, do doesn't tell you that your system is able to do this. And the problem solving, I mean, th think about what you're facing as a as a as a embryonic newt coming into this world. You can't depend on uh, how many copies of your genome you're going to have. You can't depend on uh, uh, what size of cells you're going to have. You can't depend on cell number, actually, because you can mess with that, too. You can't depend on any of that stuff. So you don't overtrain on your priors. You sort of come in with this, like, I call it beginner's mind, right? It's, it, there's an analogy here. You sort of come in, and you say, what do I have? And, and what do I have? And what tools do I have to do something coherent with whatever, with whatever I have? So that's the kind of stuff that's really hard to... Uh, dig out from, and, and we have many examples, our, our two-headed worms, there's literally nothing wrong with their genome. There's, there's no difference in their genome. The, the two-headedness is encoded in the electrical memories. It's not encoded in the, in the genome. You, if you sequence the genome, you will have no idea that these guys have two worms, uh, two heads. So, so, you know, on the one hand, yeah, the, the, the genome is critical. And of course you need to have the good hardware, but after that, there's so much more interesting stuff. There's problem-solving capacities and storage of long-term. And by the way, the two-headed animals, if you keep cutting them, they will stay two-headed, you know, permanently, right? Again, genome, no, not, not none the wiser. So yeah, I think, I think we really have to go beyond uh, the hardware and really bite the, the bullet on this idea that there's like physiological intelligence and problem-solving here. I could go on. I'll, I'll hold back just. In. <laughs> well, well, at this moment, let me uh, let me suggest because uh, originally before we hit record, I thought, well, let's part this parse this conversation in 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 two, and you all can talk about um, again non normal intelligence and and machine learning and all these different things. We're already half an hour in. I, I let's keep with this flow and explore some ideas. I do I, I do have a question, but I want to let you guys stay in in continuity here for a moment, and when when it seems appropriate, then I'll, I'll ask a question that lends itself to what you all are talking about. But Bernardo, if you do want to continue, please, by all means. And and yeah. I say that contingent upon, can you guys uh, come back for another conversation, perhaps? Would you like to get back together? Okay, oh, perfect. If you guys yeah. can do that, then then let's go. I'll let's... be delighted. And sorry yeah, yeah, for my absolutely. egotism. I'm, I'm bored of my own stuff. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I Again, feel like this... enjoying <laughs> Michael's presence. Uh, yeah. Likewise, likewise. Yeah. Th this two is planaria, I think, is two headed planaria, right? Yep. Uh, how, do you, how did you induce the two headedness by playing with fields, electromagnetic fields? Yeah. So, 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 so just to make a fine distinction, we never used 
uh, external stimulation of any kind. So we don't use fields, radiations, magnets, uh, electrodes, waves, frequencies. We don't, we don't use any of that. What, what we do is um, the, the uh, really amazing thing is that um, cells expose an interface to each other, which are ion channels and these electrical synapses called gap junctions. And that is what they use to hack each other's behavior. That is the cognitive glue that binds groups of cells into a large construction project, like we're gonna make a head or a tail or a worm or whatever. And so what we do is we manipulate those computations. And so we have techniques, everything's stolen from neuroscience, by the way. So, so all of those, we have the same techniques of uh, ion channel um, uh, uh, pharmacology, optogenetics, um, uh, changing the ion channel structures, uh, to, you know, uh, brief uh, triggers with different drugs. All of it is to play that interface, that that electrical interface. And so, what you can do is you can look and you can look at a piece of a planar, and you can see, oh, there's a voltage gradient that says one head, one tail. How can I uh, uh, change it? And then we have some computer models that we can say, okay, if you open some channels, then the pattern will change. So it's a simulator basically, and so you can force. Briefly, it only takes 48 hours. You can you can um, force a new pattern, and then that's it. Then you don't touch them again. And then from then on, you have you have revised that that physiological experience has revised their internal representation of what a correct planarian looks like. What what is our goal in morphogenetic space? That's it. Once once you've revised it, they keep to it. They 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 hold. <laughs> this this is amazing. Um, I I wanted to run uh, by you. I, I thought that actually already published so I'll, I'll be making myself vulnerable here if you say that uh, it's nonsense but um, I'm, I'm i'm grown up grown up enough to to take that with a smile if that's what you think um i i often um get asked you know bernardo you have an objective idealism idea but there is this panpsychism idea that is out there or or constitutive panpsychism you know bottom up uh, micro micro level panpsychism and um i i i have written several critiques of it um usually based on physics why it why micro constitutive panpsychism um uh, violates uh, uh quantum field theory according to which there are no particles particles are just field excitations mm -hmm. but then i try to get into the intuition of the panpsychist and the intuition they have is this we are compound beings. We are made of many, many, many cells. And cells are living organisms like the total organism is. The total organism metabolizes, the cells metabolize. So if the subject of experience, um, me, for instance, is compound and made of gazillions of metabolizing cells, then the cells must be conscious too. In other words, consciousness, the structure of consciousness must be the structure of biology uh, consciousness must be made of combined smaller subjectivities that give rise to this big subjectivity that i call me that that's the intuition of the panpsychist and the way i criticize this is the following if a, a multicellular complex multicellular organism like me were formed by bazillions of little cells crawling towards one another and then piling up on top of one another, then I would be a compound subject because I was assembled. But I'm not assembled. I, I grew. Um, and my postulate is that uh, in growth, what we have is not a compound organism, but an internally differentiated organism. So my contention is that I am still that unitary zygote that I was when my father's sperm uh, uh, entered my mother's egg. That was a single-celled organism. Um, my contention is I am still that unitary organism, but there has been internal differentiation in that organism, an internal differentiation that is self-similar. In other words, a zygote is a single cell, so it can only complexify by reapplying that same template it knows how to be, in other words, a single cell, to itself. And that's what we call mitosis, that, that, that's cell division. Cell division is not multiple cells piling up on top of one another. It's one cell internally differentiating by a recursive application of the one template it knows how to be, which is to be a cell. So my contention is that 
multicellular organisms are not compound, they are highly internally differentiated unitary organisms. Uh, I, I wonder what your intuitions uh, mm -hmm. tell you about this. Mm -hmm. That's a super interesting idea. Um, well, I think there's something to this, uh, to this, but um, I wonder, so let's think about this. So, so we have, we have a number of examples. So, so there's a few things you can do. First of all, experimentally, uh, just like in, in human or other mammalian, in fact, many species embryos, in addition to cutting embryos and pieces and having multiple beings, you can also combine them. So, so we can take uh, early, uh, we, you know, we could take two early embryos, mush them together like a snowball, and you get one, you know, one being out of it, right? At the at the end, who will report, uh, you know, a unitary consciousness and all that. So, uh, and and our xenobots is a simple, a much more simple model of that. We do similarly. We dissociate a bunch of skin cells, leave them alone, and they come together and they form this coherent thing that has the behaviors and and memories and and so on that don't belong to the individual cells. So, I mean, there is a there is a process of. Uh, 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 you know, I don't know, the combination or accretion that you can do. But I do think that, you know, there is there is something to it, I think. And, and I wish I'm, I haven't I haven't uh, uh, written this up yet, but I'm, I'm working on a on a paper called booting up the agent, which is like literally the earliest steps of what happens when a new being comes into the world. Like what are, what are the earliest steps, you know, from the beginning? And so so I, I, I'm, I'm wrestling with this issue and I think there might be um some some special things that happen when you are a lineage you know you're a you're a uh, as you as you emphasized a, a continuous lineage but but you know but what we do have these uh, these composite um composite beings too and in the end i mean i think we also should probably talk about what's the um what's the what what, what do we want from the wording here from the terminology right when we say it's uh, in fact from all the terminology in all this field you know um uh, cognitive uh, intelligent uh, they may be conscious uh, what, what what do we want these words to do right and to me what i think they are for is i i think they're all protocol claims in other words what they are is when somebody tells me that i think this thing is unified or it is intelligent or it's actually made up of three different uh, you know minds or, or whatever it is what i think they're telling me is here is a set of um here is a set of uh, techniques that you can use to interact with it. And, and that's an empirical claim. You might find that somebody else might have a different perspective and you can see which one actually works, works better for you. So I think, you know, from this, is it unified? Is it dissociated? From some perspectives, I think there's absolutely benefit to seeing it as, as a unified uh, self, of course. And then there are other situations in which you would do well to recognize that they're actually competing, whether they be psychological modules or literally anatomical things like the right hemisphere from whom usually you don't hear, but, the, but it actually can have different opinions than the, than the left one, as, as we know from split brain patients and so on. Uh, you know, there are be other scenarios where you're better off focusing on the, um, on the components. And so I think, you know, I, th I think both can be useful. You were alluding to, to, to Chimera. Right, when you, when uh, you for, 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 for for example, yeah, I mean that's one, and and then we can make all sorts of so so one can construct initially just um, kind of in your mind, but now actually in the laboratory you can construct all kinds of interesting connections, right, between in in, in bodies and also in 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 brains and thus minds. Um, you know that that border. I I think the border. So so I think I think you're right in that there's something quite. Uh, special in uh, being um, in, in a being that that self assembles from uh, together from, from from that that has a lineage like that. I think there's something special there, but I also think that that border between self and world is actually quite plastic, and there are many ways to change it. And that means that the question of how many are you is doesn't have a single answer at all times. I think it can it can actually change. You know, it can change in time. In Chimera, th th these are two organisms with different dna uh, right that you can do that together. too you can you can do that too or you can keep the same dna or yeah or you can use different dna yeah D different like, source cells yeah uh, like cats when you have a cat that is black on one side and orange on the other side that's a chimera right so you can do that it, you can do that in my group we make frog -lottles, which is part frog part axolotl and uh, you can combine i mean life life is because because of this problem solving kind of fundamental thing uh 
it is incredibly interoperable. You can put things together like just unbelievable. You'll get something out of almost anything. And uh, but you have to do that early, right? I mean, uh, soon in, in, in embryonic development, you can no longer paste them together uh, so they grow as one. No, no, you can. You, I mean, th there's more plasticity early because I think uh, that 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 boundary is is firms up with, as you go along. But you can absolutely paste things together later. Um, you can even. Uh, I mean, they've even done. You know, neuroscientists uh, do stuff like uh, with 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 sensory augmentation and so on. I remember there was an experiment where they had linked two mouse brains together, and one was in New York, and one was in I think England or something, and then the mice were running mazes. And they could do better because because of this link, right? There was some kind of like um, you know group computation that was happening. I don't remember the exact details, but but even even in adulthood, you can have these interfaces that uh, that change. Um, you know, you and and I can like I I imagine we could uh, even in adulthood we could connect our hemispheres together, right? Uh, and in in with with various interfaces and eventually with like bugwood biological interface. You know, I think I think that plasticity. And certainly in some animals, it's it's throughout their lifespan. In mammals, it tends to kind of go down a little bit. But fascinating. Mm. There was I, a guy. I, there, you, you might enjoy this. There was a guy. There was a there's a book called Shuffle Brain, um, and there was this guy Paul Peach in the '80s who uh, he did a bunch of experiments in in uh, in axolotl brains and sort of rearranging the pieces of the brain. But he also did some transplants from from. Um, goldfish uh, from goldfish into into the axolotl you know the goldfish is a vegetarian the the, the axolotl is a is a is a meat eater and and they would they would shift different parts of the brain around and look at the behavior uh and have these composite like new new behaviors you know because the axolotls are pretty plastic um i i i i still have the uh, it, what you said is is informative and 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 and, and an eye-opening even but uh, we still don't make unitary organisms by pasting cells together, right? I mean, they, even in Chimera, there, there is growth that needs to happen afterwards. Something has to grow together. Yeah. Well, usually, I mean, xenobots are, are, are an example of, of, of cells that come together and that's it. They don't need to grow, you know, within, within 48 hours, they're an organism, nothing needs to grow for, for that. But, but that's a primitive, I mean, I, I, I agree with you completely that, that there is something special in having a joint lineage together, right? I, in, the case of, in, in the case of xenobots, the, the question would be, is a xenobot a unified consciousness? I would say it isn't. Uh, the skin cells are one thing. The the the, the heart cells are another thing. They, they are mechanically or uh, physically together, but they aren't unified. I, I would imagine from their own perspective. It's a good question. Uh, I and so so by the way, there are two kinds of xenobots. There's the kind that we make from the a sheet of skin and some ner and some uh, uh, muscle cells. There's the other kind that's purely skin and it's a dissociated cells that come together. That's the kind that that, that I was talking about. Um, I don't have a firm answer on whether they're unified or not, but my gut feeling is, and we're doing those experiments now. So, so one of the things that we've never made any claims on, and which because we haven't published it yet, is uh, the extent to which they learn from their experience. They have preferences, uh, you know, all the, the, those kinds of things. Uh, I, based on the data we have now, and this will come, I don't know, in the next maybe four or five months, so this will be out. Uh, I, it, it it looks to me like a coherent organism doing things in doing things in a space that the individual cells don't have access to, which sounds to me like the same criteria we use for recognizing unitary intelligence and in other things that are not ourselves, right? It seems to me like I mean this is very tough, as you well know. This is this is tough to answer questions like that because because how do you actually right? How do you until until you mind meld with that uh, with, with that xenobite, you don't really know what you know if, what it feels like, right? So so these are these are tough, but but to the extent that we can have behavioral evidence for, for and physio oh actually actually even better. Um, one of the things that we're doing is. Uh, we so 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 that even though it's skin and not neurons, there's a ton of uh, calcium activity, and calcium is a pretty good indicator of cellular computations that are happening. And one thing we can do is apply measures of integrated information. Doesn't have to be exactly IIT, but but there are many kind of you know you know the many kind of um, 
um, uh, tools now to look at uh, how much integrated processing there is. And so, and, and looking for things like sleep and, uh, and, you know, changes of awareness and attention and integration and, and so on. Uh, we're doing all that. So at some point we may actually have a quantitative readout to say, actually all these cells are just acting separately and that they just happen to be glued together and that's it. Or we might say that, oh, look, the most parsimonious explanation is that there's a coherent, you know, basically the same thing that people get in brain. So we'll know. I think in the next few months, we'll have, we'll have some evidence for that. A, a case could in principle be made that even um, in our case, humans mm. with unified consciousness, mm. a, a case could be made that we have internal dissociative boundaries they, they, yeah. they are not as clear cut as the dissociative boundary between us and the environment um, but I cannot introspect into my liver function mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. my kidney function mm -hmm. um, all in all I, I cannot introspect into most autonomous physiological functions I can introspect into um, brain physiology to some extent, the neural cor correlates of consciousness, but I can't introspect into my left big toe. Um, and evolutionarily, I think th this makes a, a lot of sense. Um, liver function does not depend on deliberation based on environmental data. It's something that always has to run anyway and in the same way. So there is no benefit for the reporting ego to sort of directly and introspectively access that. Um, an analogy I like to use is uh, riding a bike, which becomes autonomous through training. So it sort of dissociates from the ego, has its own separate dynamics, but we can try to take deliberate control over every single muscle movement we make when we are riding a bike. It doesn't take very long at all for us to decide that it's better to leave those muscle movements to themselves. Um, same with breathing. We can take deliberate control uh, over our breathing, um, but if we require, if we were required to have breathing being introspectively accessed for it to work, life would be exhausting. I would always have to pay attention to to yeah. my my breath. Yeah. So I think evolutionarily, it makes sense that there are internal dissociative boundaries, maybe not very strong, but they are there in order to you know, f for the sake of the autonomous functions running good, well, and all the time. So even if you use IIT, um, you know, these reentrant loops of information integration that we see in the parietal lobes, uh, you're seeing certain patterns of brain activity, anatomically, it's impossible to find that in the rest of the body, not that level of integration. And because of the exclusion principle of IIT, it, it follows immediately that that um, the rest of the body, if it's made of mental processes that appear as, as physicality, uh, it, it's necessarily the case that because of the exclusion principle, they will become dissociated from the reporting ego. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? If, yeah. if there yeah, yeah, were yeah. no reporting ego, then the exclusion principle wouldn't kick in and yeah. you and you may have uh, weakly integrated, but still without suffering from exclusion, um, unified organism. Um, but because the ego is has so many, well, the the, the default mode network or whatever are the the correlates of uh, the the reporting ego, there are so many reentrant loops, so much information integration that you always get a higher phi by excluding everything else than you would get if you included everything else. Um, so even in the case of unitary organisms, if you're, you, if you're borrowing from IIT, you would still have this, mo this inner life of a multitude of complexes, each one which is probably conscious from its own perspective, mm -hmm. but not accessible from the others. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I wonder if you want to comment on this. Yeah, yeah, no, this is, this is great. Uh, so, so I, I, I agree with, with, with almost all of that. I think that, um, 
one one of the so 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 uh so people people uh say sometimes to me uh well you know uh I mean, I don't feel like my liver is conscious. I said, well, you don't feel like I'm conscious either. Of course you don't, uh, right? It's, and so and so I tend to think that part of our problem is that all of our sense organs kind of face into this three-dimensional world. Like, And I, I try to imagine if we had evolved with a, a direct sense of our blood chemistry, let's say 20, let's say you could feel like with a tongue kind of thing, you could feel, you know, 20 different parameters of your blood chemistry. I think then we would have an immediate uh, ability to recognize our liver as an intelligent agent, we wouldn't feel its consciousness, but we would we would see it solving problems in this space. We'd say, "Wow, look at this thing go! It's moving around and avoiding all these problems, and it's clearly intelligent." I don't have access to it, but you know, but but there it is. And uh, from that from that perspective, the other thing is that these these reentrant loops and so on, a lot of that kind of. Uh, the, the, those architectures that are very familiar in neuroscience, we don't really know how to detect them in other kinds of tissues. I mean, the, the, this is one thing that we're working on very, very actively is to look at the bioelectric paths in other types of tissues, where it's not as obvious as it is in neuroscience, where, you know, where these, uh, well, what's, what's actually communicating with what. And it's entirely possible that what we're going to find is that within itself, it it has a it has a perfectly perfectly you know good and it doesn't have to be five specifically but you know a perfectly a perfectly good integrated um a, a, in, information processing and I, you know I don't know about this exclusion postulate in general like I understand the motivation for it but I, I'm not I'm not sure I think that for the exact same reasons if if we weren't so tied to three dimensional space which everybody is very like focused on you know behavior in 3d space that's intelligence if if we weren't so focused on that i think that it would be much easier for us to visualize that we are in fact uh, a, a patchwork of of intelligent agents um, that are to some extent connected and as you say we don't usually have conscious although as far as i know dolphins actually have voluntary breathing i believe that's true that they actually they actually can and do have to regulate regulate their breathing consciously uh I, I think it would be easier for us to see that. And I think that for the exact same reasons we attribute consciousness to uh, based on behavior and physiology to others, you know, you, you and I and so on. I think for those exact same reasons, we would have to attribute it to our various components. In fact, a student of mine and I once we, we made a table of for, for every it sort of got columns for all the um, uh, for, uh, kind of uh, major theories of consciousness. And then, you know, what, what does each what, what are what what are the uh, features of the brain that each of these theories says is responsible for consciousness, right? There are many different. And, and so what what we can see is that pretty much pretty much every structure in the body matches most of that as far as we know, right? It's very hard to say exactly once, I mean, it seems easy to, to, to say why your brain's different, but it's actually, it's actually not at all. If, you, if you're willing to look at other spaces that are, let's say, physiological space and so on, and different time scales, because that's another thing, right? People are used to very rapid sort of millisecond scale neural processing. These other things go on for hours or, and things like that. But, but if, you're, if you're willing to, to make those changes, uh, you start to see that exact same thing all over the body. So, uh, you know, I don't know. It's a... yeah, the, the, the exclusion principle, in, in my understanding of it, is that it, it's largely based on the information we gather, gather about consciousness through introspection. It, it can be, the exclusion principle can be a good model of what happens, for instance, with attention or metacognitive mechanisms in which you restrict the the contents of experience to a very narrow area, um, but you also sort of boost that narrow area and you become very aware of detail, of subtlety and nuance mm -hmm. uh, for the price of sort of losing your peripheral vision. So mm -hmm. that's what the exclusion principle tries mm -hmm. to model. But it's by nature a very relative principle. It has to do with, you know, how you get the highest phi by, by folding everything into one complex or by s splitting a part of that complex as a separate thing. Mm -hmm. You may get more phi based on that, especially in IIT4. There's a lot of information theory built into that that allows you to see that mathematically that's what should happen. But the point I was trying to make, uh, Michael, is that mm -hmm. um, even if there are this semi-dissociative boundaries internally because we can't introspect into the liver, 
to, just entertain that with me for the sake of argument. Let, mm -hmm. let's, let's assume that that's the case, at least from the point of view of something happening in the brain, yep. the rest of the body seems to be more or less dissociated. Yep. Um, that's still not the same as getting liver cancer. So th there, there seems to be um, two, two layers here. They may be fundamentally constitute of the same mechanisms, but cancer is a fundamental dissociation at the level of, of the organism. It's, it's when a part of that organism no longer follows, no longer follows the global template. It goes off in its own uh, uh, organizational route, uh, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do see that as a dissociation. I understood from you that you see that as such as yeah, well. Yeah. So yeah. We, we are entirely aligned there. Mm -hmm. But yet that seems to be a different level of dissociation than the one between the liver and the brain when I don't have cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. I think it's a different level. I think I think all of this is a continuum, right? And by the way, interestingly enough, we've shown that you can you can force reassociation uh, on on cancer cells, and you can normalize them by at least in the frog model. We're now trying to move to human, but but in the frog model, you can you can force them to reassociate, and uh, you know, and then and then despite whatever g genetic issues they had, they they start following the normal thing of making nice muscle and skin and and everything else. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. I think I think it's uh, it's a different uh, it's a difference of of degree. And um, there's an old uh, there's an old book that Wilhelm Ruh uh, wrote years ago called The Struggle of the Parts, and uh, it's. Uh, you know, he talks about, and actually there's all this, uh, during, during development, a lot of the organs are actually in active competition with each other. So they compete and it's actually quite important that they do that for, for coordination and so on. Um, so yeah, I think there are different degrees of, of dissociation, both in the, the anatomically in the body, but also temporally with, with over time. And then, and then, you know, also we need to think about these really weird cases where, um, there's metamorphosis. So, like caterpillar butterfly, for example, right? So, so you've got this caterpillar, which is basically the soft body be being that, had, that there's no hard element, so you, you can't push on anything. So it has a controller. It has this brain that, that the sort of, you know, it controls it uh, the, all the, the, in a particular way, the suitable for soft body robotics and so on. And it lives in the two-dimensional world and it eats the plants and so on. And then it has to become this completely different being. It has to become this butterfly, which is a hard-bodied organism, lives in a three-dimensional world, drinks nectar, not, not eats leaves and so on. And there's good evidence that the, even though the brain is basically taken apart and reassembled into a new structure, many of the cells die. In fact, I think most of the cells die and so on. Memories remain. So when you train the caterpillar, the butterfly still remembers the original memories, even though the brain has been completely re re refactored, which is you know kind of incredible. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, I think this um, these these boundaries and what's that like, right? So so we, you know, in philosophy they ask, what what's it like to be a butterfly? Well, what's it like to be a caterpillar becoming a butterfly? You know, <laughs> it's a second order question there. Like, can you imagine in the lifetime of a single organism to be complete? And we go through as in puberty, we kind of have a little bit of that, right? Uh, some 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 priorities shift around for us, and some brain structure changes and so on. But 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 nothing. But but this is like a seriously uh, uh, a, 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 a huge example of that where you're just a completely different organism at the end um there, there was this paper published 10 years ago 2013 mm -hmm. where uh, they they trained planaria to navigate an irregular environment to find food mm. and then they decapitated the planaria threw the heads away waited for two weeks for the new heads to come up yep. put the planaria in there in that environment and the planaria remembered how to navigate the environment to yeah to yeah that was food. us that was us by the way that, oh, was, that's what, that, that, that was that was us. your group yeah. Yeah. were you a co-author of that Oh yeah, I was the yeah, I was the PI. Yeah, Tal Shomrat was my postdoc who did that. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, I missed that. Uh, shame yeah. on me. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, that, yeah, that was us. I mean, the original findings. This was by McConnell in the '60s, right? He reported that in the '60s, that kind of stuff, and he did it, of course, manually with and then every with rats, right? It, it was very controversial, and and every, you know, some people were were very much against it and whatever. But but we did it in 2013. We did it with modern uh, tools with a fully automated setup, where like it, you know, it records everything. You don't have to be there to make decisions about what you see, and uh, yeah. Yeah, no, he was absolutely right. It does, and and that's the amazing. So 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 here's the amazing thing. I guess we can we can sort of uh, end on this on this wild uh, speculation. You you cut off the brain, 
the tail sits there doing nothing for you know 10 days until the new brain is rebuilt and then you can see that it has the behavior so during that time that information is somehow getting re-imprinted onto the new brain so that it can show you the appropriate uh, behavioral um, uh, uh, consequences we assume that it's in the rest of the body somewhere but we don't actually know that you know I, we don't know where it is and and you can imagine right and so not to get too too weird but 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 it's an assumption that it's that it's physically encoded in the in the rest of the body i'm i i, I don't know um you know this this remains to be this remains to be to be seen uh, I, do you have five minutes more uh, sure yeah yeah okay. sure but, but i wanted to try to to bring the whole thing together Perfect. um if I were a panpsychist, a constitutive panpsychist, I could find a way to derive support for my theory based on what you said. Like if you can jam cells together in a way that you force an association between them such that they have a unified consciousness, I would say, well, then th that's the combination combination problem being solved um, right there. You may, you may not know what the mechanism exactly is but empirically you could say that that's evidence for the combination uh, problem being solved how do fundamentally separate micro subjects become a unified macro subject mm. um, but of course the panpsychist does not assume an underlying field of subjectivity unifying all nature the panpsychist thinks that the subjectivity of each of those cells that are jammed together is fundamentally separate from one another because mm -hmm. they are associated with uh, fundamental particles that really have spatial boundaries. But I gather from you that your intuition is that you're, you are just dissociating and reassociating mental processes in what is already an underlying unified field. Is that true? Uh, do, I see, uh do I read you correctly? Uh, you, you, yeah, you, you read me correctly. I, I agree with that uh, f fundamentally. I, you know, part of what we have to do in the lab is sort of squeeze down to some minimal things that we can use to to do experiments and the, given the available um, the tools and paradigms, right? So, so uh, you know, from that perspective, the the panpsychist thing is plenty weird enough in that uh, that you know that already sort of takes us right to the edge of what's doable and so I, I see our work as really focused on the scaling problem but 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 yeah I mean if if I had to just guess as to what's really going on I, I think what you just said is 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 more correct I'll make a parting comment uh, on memory not to I, I could I could speak to you for the rest of the day uh, by the way awesome. Uh, my parting comment regarding memory uh, is, is just it's just a speculation, just to leave an idea behind uh, for mm. people to do whatever they want with. I mean, the universe is such that um, we can only observe its present state. Mm. You cannot point at the past and say, mm. there it is, have a mm. look at it. Mm. And you cannot uh, get a piece of the future for me to measure. Mm. Uh, past and future states are not physical in the sense that they are not measurable they can be remembered or inferred recorded or or anticipated but they are they are not physical yep. you can't point at them you can't get me a piece of them if memory what we call memory is actually access to past states not only the original episodic memory but also access to the past state of remembering the original memory uh, and remembering, remembering the original episodic memory. If what we are doing when we remember is actually accessing past states, then those states will not have a physical reflection because past and future states are not physically observable. Uh, of course, we think of memory as present states, as a little file on a hard disk that is presently accessible and therefore should have a physical representation but if what we are doing through access pathway is using the hypocampus and all that, and of course, if you screw up the hypocampus, you can't access those states anymore. But he, here we are talking about access, not, not the memory content. Um, if memory is indeed an access to a past state, it will not be found either on the planaria's head or on the planaria's body or anywhere in the rat's brain after you cut off 90% of it. Because the, we are in a universe in which past and future states are not uh, do not have physical correlates. Uh, mm. 
Mm. Food Amazing. for thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's very profound. Uh, we, there's plenty to talk about there. So yeah, that's that's a good that's a good topic for the next one, I think. Yeah, gentlemen, this this is Great. exactly what I was hoping for uh, in terms of context, and so thank you both. One quick amendment, uh, Michael, to the uh, Gauls that you were speaking to. I have some friends that are USDA researchers or entomologists, and they're working on HLB, which is a psyllid vectored, vectored uh, disease in citrus, uh, Huan Lung Bing, and part, they're doing novel out of the box thinking. And one thing they're doing is something called a symbiote. And mm. it's a sort of transcambrium, you've probably heard of this, it's a transcambrium systemic, and they're using corn messages from from genetics and other other plant it's it's not quite gmo but it is it is a symbiotic mm. uh exchange just like the gall and so they're actually applying that and i can't find anything in the literature but one of the researchers and i are working on uh getting that set up so i can always pass that on to you if you're if you're interested cool. yeah yeah uh, please do yeah, yeah the, that sounds that's that sounds already sort of uh having utility in that discipline so just wanted mm -hmm. to share mm -hmm. that thought um, yeah, cool. So to both of you, much gratitude. Thank you so yeah, thank much. You so much. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Enriching. Yeah. yeah. And Bernardo, thank you. Much. Amazing. Yeah. And let's do thank a part two. Uh, let me say goodbye to you both. Uh, we'll stop record. Thank you, YouTube audience. I hope this was enriching for you and uh, there'll be another uh, part two. So look forward to that.